You might have heard me say Bactria is the easiest faction to play as in Rome 2. However, as you are about to experience in this story, one choice, one stupid decision is enough to turn all your neighbors against you, turning this easy campaign into a battle for survival. This all began as any regular campaign. We started recruiting for our army, researching the things we needed, and spending practically all our treasury on infrastructure. You know, the basics and all that. Perfectly in line with the Divided Empire Economic Guide you can find in the top right corner. After unifying our province, I plan to fortify our lands while waiting for the Seleucid satraps to rebel. Which actually didn't take all that long to happen. I mean, as you can see, we still have to pacify our own provinces. There's nothing our own armies can't handle, but they won't be able to guard our lands forever as our food supply is about to run out. This made me start eyeing up our neighbor Hariva. To be fair, they hold two of our natural expansion routes, so war was fated to happen anyway. It was a bit scary as their two armies disappeared right after we declared war on them. It did encourage us to build up a second army though. Oh boy, we are gonna need it. After capturing Magian, we had to fend off a sizable counterattack led by her rival's impressive elephant contingent. But you know us, we are too clever to fall for that. We have the farmlands we desire. Honestly, this was where I wanted our military conquest to stop. Just for a few turns so we could stabilize our realm. However, as both Shranka and Parthia joined the side of our enemies, that wasn't an option. The situation in itself wasn't too bad yet. We have allies of our own, you know, for now. As we waited for our armies to replenish, Parthia was wiped out. This means we were able to send two armies south for the strategically crucial town of Area. It was quite fortified, but as they sallied out on the field, the odds became more even. Our cavalry created a barrier of sorts, while the rest of our infantry linked up. However, the trees concealed the fact that all of the hostile infantry were focused on one flank. The only reason we survived was due to our faction leader sacrificing himself. Such a heroic action will never be forgotten. Too bad we actually ended up losing the city right away in the middle of our conversion process. So we practically lost two armies worth of manpower plus a general for nothing. Oh wait, this attack on area? It wasn't exactly the bad decision I talked about. It comes next. Another faction known as Atropad Khan swooped in, besieged and then also occupied the city, right before we were able to enact revenge. I was absolutely furious. Literally, I was like, we spilled blood for these walls. This city should be ours. So I took it. Honestly, if I had known the consequences of this decision, I would have never done it. The true question is, was this worth it? Absolutely fucking not. Both our armies were crippled with merely a small regiment further north made up of levies to protect our kingdom. And the land is rebelling so that is great. One of the many Atropad Khan subjects took advantage of our weakened state. It was a pure miracle we prevailed. But it was at the cost of our last hoplite forces. We can't stay here, but we can't leave either, as Atropad Khan is already counterattacking. Our nomad allies managed to hold them off this first time. They won't be able to do it again. Our small army returned to Bactria to muster more men for our army, but as I didn't think we would even need the barracks in this province ever again, I had already demolished it and converted the land into more economy. While he was there, we also discovered how horrible the public order was. We had to turn our tax rate all the way down to avoid rebellions. This public order threat was made worse by the fact that it was an actual slave vault. So far, the other uprisings have been dealt with by our allies. But this one would be too much for them. This internal threat was made worse by our discoveries in the west. Four armies are coming for us. We neither had the manpower nor time to create a new army to save our disastrous situation. All we could do was try to fortify Area, and with a threat this severe, 
time can only be gained through victory. Our only real mistake here was forgetting how few infantry units we had. I mean, our skirmishers held their own, but damn. That battle gave us about one more turn or so, no more than that. At least our new barracks on the front lines allowed us to field three new hoplites. The army we defeated was immediately replaced by another. We tried to use stealth to slow them down, but failed. So instead, we brought down the northern levies as reinforcements, which led to the Atropat Khan forces vanishing into the fog of war. We quickly figured out it was because they planned to march towards our capital through the northern and less fortified rounds. This means our reinforcements couldn't abandon their post. So as we only had one decent army, we had to find a way to march them north too. It was made possible by assassinating and launching an absurd assault on a fortification in the south that was pinning us down. This victory was followed by us subjugating their lands. Instead of the northern army, we called for the smaller retinue guarding Arachosia in the southeast to help defend Araya. Oh, and the rebels? Every single time our nomadic allies dealt with them. So that's fine. It was probably the only good thing about the situation we are in right now. However, this one time, they couldn't actually seem to finish the job. Hence, we plotted to pinch at them the next turn. But that scheme never came to pass. Our only farming settlement was lost. A counterattack was set in motion, but we didn't follow through with it after receiving the news of yet another and even more significant threat from the south. All of you probably expected a war with the Morian sooner or later. Well, here it is. This meant our two inferior armies had to leave everything behind to dodge a Persian attack. It was a close call, but in the end, we made it back safely into the walls of our capital. But look at this. We are nowhere near out of danger. It's not even these not so distant armies we have to worry about, but the ones just marching around in our lands unopposed. Like, what could I have done here? Instead of confronting us in area, they just moved around, hitting our client state in the south. This vile act of theirs had to be punished. And there's only one proper way to enact revenge. With fire. This battle was quickly followed up by an attack on the Morian army. This heroic victory accomplished probably as much as you did all day. Nothing. We just butchered two armies, but three more were about to take their place. Our units have just been weakened by this, nothing else. Can you see how horrible this decision earlier was? Back up in the north, we had formed an army of levies to hopefully retake the lost farmland. But as we moved into hostile territory, we immediately had to fight a Persian army. This victory was good and all, but as you might have realized, there is a pattern to this. Cut one army down, and another takes its place. Only this time, we fled to a favorable location. Or so I thought. I tried to steal back the farmland from right under their nose, as they believed it was undefended. Oh, how wrong I was. This army now found itself surrounded by two new hostile forces. We are also in a standoff with two Atropakan armies in the south, by the way, along with the Morians, who are trying to export our situation and are moving for our homeland. So these armies are completely new. So we made a bold escape through Nomad territory, which actually was trespassing. So that's actually not that good that we're doing this. In terms of the Morian threat, I sent whatever levies I could acquire with our limited budget south into attrition territory to stop them. This meant that we left our capital unguarded. So now the Atropakian armies were able to lay siege to Bactra. 
Our entire economy is now in red, by the way. Just look at how crazy this is. With our homeland threatened and as another Atrapakan army arrived in Araya, along with the rebellion, we had to abandon the city. The siege of our capital was something the Morians were eager to participate in as well, with them just moving past our defensive position and straight towards our core regions, cutting off any possible reinforcements from the south. Just so you understand our situation, this is the location of all hostile armies, threatening our lands. Defended by just one reasonable army which apparently is suffering attrition from lack of supplies. This major threat culminated in the siege of Bactra. We knew fighting for victory was impossible, but time. If we hold out for long enough, our reinforcements from the south could find another way up here to break the siege. Bactra had multiple layers of walls to help us in that objective. That and the army we formerly had sent on a counter-attack made it back just in time. Or so we thought. Their pursuers had caught up with them. There was no time for them to get inside the walls. Quickly realizing the battle out in the open was a lost cause, the commander of that army abandoned his men in favor of the safety within the city. Luckily, our garrison still defended the walls, even coming as far as to trapping a large portion of that Trapatkan troops in the choke point. Our defenders were running low on stamina, their morale depleting, and basically everything was turning to shit. But the time was ticking. It was only a matter of time before we actually survived. We just have to hold on. Our second army has been destroyed. Only the general and a few archers made it inside the city. But it took the hostiles 20 minutes to do so. We just needed to hold out for the same amount of time to survive. Our men were dying like flies. But that statement goes both ways. The Atropatkan commander foolishly decided all his forces should push through one single tower. Meaning all we had to do was hold this exact choke point. One by one we made their men rout, edging us ever closer to victory. They kept swarming over the walls, but the men held their ground. Our own generals never actually saw combat. They just sat atop the Acropolis watching his men save the day. It was a heroic victory. We even killed one of the hostile commanders. But this just felt like delaying the inevitable. Avraya, the city we had spilled so much blood for, felt too. We were pushed back to just two provinces. However, this actually turned out to be in our favor. After so much intense conflict, Avraya had run out of supplies. So now the city was a liability for Atropat Khan and was actually harming four hostile armies. This was exactly what we needed to survive. Our own weakened armies, which we allowed to abandon the south, couldn't actually reinforce Bactra as they were trapped behind a Morian army. They tried to take out our armies then and there, as we couldn't escape. But apparently we had nothing to worry about. The men at our command exceeded all expectations and scored a heroic victory. After the battle, we teamed up with the army from Bactra to clean up the province. Besides, the attacking Atropat Khan armies were retreating. Is this where it all turns around for us? Well, not exactly. We failed to make peace with the behemoth of a superpower to the west of us. And the Morians were still on the offense. By now, we had an army in the south to deal with that issue. Okay, so regarding the other Atropat Khan armies, I have regained quite a lot of confidence after actually surviving this siege from earlier. So as I realized how weakened their armies were after the attrition from Araya, my thoughts were like, surely we can defeat them now. So after having mustered a few more men, I led a massive attack. But I had actually tunnel visioned myself as I forgot how weak our troops actually were. The entire left flank broke after a single cavalry charge. We really need better armies than this.
After the failed attack, they captured and killed one of my best officers. A tragedy for sure, if not for the fact that we were able to finish off one Atrapargan army due to them being too far away from each other. The second army fled south in vain, where our local garrison took care of them. In the meantime, we kept mass producing levies for our armies. In case you haven't guessed it, our strategy was basically throw bodies at them. I mean, it has worked so far. Kinda. A third Morian army attacked after this, but once again we handled the situation. Wait, our land's actually free from hostiles? Okay, now it is time to celebrate. Immediately after this, we launched forward, grabbing back Avaria and Marguerain. No chance we will let go of them now. We even went as far as Susia. The town was liberated of course, as we had no chance of ever holding it for more than two turns. A settlement we did occupy though was Amul. Persians had previously stolen it from our nomad allies. So as it was unguarded right now, due to us forcing Atrapakan back into Persia, it was an obvious choice to take it. The entire province was now ours. However, this short trip to the north meant the farming settlement Magyain was less fortified than intended. Luckily for us, they came at our defenses in waves. This made our job so much easier as our men could easily carve them down. We also sent an army south to handle the threat from that front. It did look kinda scary with the Morian army so close. But the terrain of the province actually kept us safe, meaning we could just besiege the town. Not wanting this grave situation from the beginning of this video to befall us again, I placed spies on the most direct routes into our territory. This way we would know if they moved against us again. The following turn we liberated our southern border, reinstating our fallen affiliates. From this we discovered an additional two sets of Morian armies counterattacking our location. So as our armies were too weak and as the rebellion was raiding Avraer, we returned back north again. By the way, can someone please explain to me why on earth the Seleucids are at war with us? Basically, every faction known to us in the west hates us. We also received the news of the Atropak and scholars and generals reforming their armies. So that was great. Actually, it was. For some blessed reason, this allowed us to muster Indo-Hellenic units from our frontier. If you don't understand why this is great, let me explain it to you. We are fighting countless armies, meaning we needed fully replenished armies to have a chance of winning. But that requires the right type of population, which we only can get from our home provinces. So beforehand, our armies always had to return home to replenish, just to then make their way back out to the front lines. A tremendous task. Worst of all, this allowed our enemies to muster new armies to beat us with. A constant drain of our manpower, until now. These Indo-Hellenic units are from the foreigner population, which can be found in every single region in the world. So now, with these units, we actually don't have to go home after every single attack. You see? Now we have a chance of defeating them. All by it being a small one. But we still needed to get enough of them, which turned out to be a challenge as several armies were coming for us. So why not just slow them down, right? It might not have been possible in the south, but Nicaea was right for the taking. Our first real attack into Persia. By the way, just take a quick look and enjoy how powerful this new army looks. Now that is an army with the potential of glorious deeds. The Atropat Khan attack on our capital in the beginning actually inspired me. Instead of focusing down one part of a wall, we will have equipment that can give us multiple access points. The first time we made use of this new weaponry was actually against the Morian fortification. Our artillery battalions absolutely obliterated their forces, who tried to rush out through one exit. And the ones who actually made it out felt the charge for our new indo hellenic warriors. It was a slaughter. After that victory, we finished off the leftovers to then liberate the town, again. We actually did the exact same thing for Satrakata. It came at the expense of our entire fighting force. But look at this, it is replenishing on the front lines. The only real difference between the two towns was that the southern one was immediately lost. Again. You know what? That town is probably useless by now. I have no count on how many times it switched sides. 
but eventually, I promise you, it ended up under our influence. After realizing the Morian armies were mostly scattered within our own territory, I decided to take the battle to them, just to find a random Atropat Khan army there. We defeated them with a decisive victory and followed it up with us conquering Kamana along with its great wonder, which I definitely can't pronounce. After that, the idea was to go for Hamosea, but as it was heavily fortified, we moved on to Persepolis. A bad idea as this just started a chase after our strongest army. It had already suffered heavy casualties and was now also suffering from attrition. Truly terrible. Our gains were lost right after our departure. But look at this! While that army was campaigning in Moria, our other armies had cleaned up our own territory. Those victorious armies were now marching for a strategically important city in the middle of Persia. And it just so happens that this was directly in line with the escape route by our fleeing army. Once they had linked up, they decided to strike. We threw everything we could at their walls, creating three breaches for our men to attack. Although we had no luck with two of the gaps, the third one granted us access to their courtyard, where we then, after a prolonged period of time, outflanked their men, scoring us a costly victory. We lost half of all our forces. Devastating. But the city was raised. Our faction leader he returned home to gather more troops for our future plans. But he didn't get to stay there for more than a turn as the Atropat Khan armies were already counterattacking. We defeated the first wave but had no chance against the second assault. We lost everything here. The faction leader, the heir to the kingdom and all three armies. Only a few skirmishes made it out. Both Satrakata and Susia fell while we were licking our wounds back home. This was absolutely devastating for us. Or oh, not quite. I wasn't foolish enough to commit all our armies to attack the Persians. As a matter of fact, I had also planned a second invasion of Moria. Here they managed to liberate Ashvakas and even push for Pura. Combine this with the fact that we had just defeated another Morian army in the north. That specific war looked quite promising. We still had to be careful not to be caught off guard though. Mysteriously, after an assault on Susia, we actually couldn't liberate the town. My best guess was that it wasn't possible due to the remnants still scavenging the land. Our plan to attack Pura was halted after discovering the Morians had reinforced the city. We managed to defeat them after they sallied out, but the following attrition gave us no choice but to end our campaign in the south early. The losses we suffered were quite severe. Once again, due to the Indo-Hellenic units, we were quick to raise another army. Nevertheless, after a long time, where we have played defensive, we marched out again. This time, I had a new plan. We were gonna march all the way into the heart of Persia, demolish their economic provinces, destroy their crops, and overall just give us an edge. Basically, we ended up liberating three different settlements and eventually laying siege to their capital. It was a very risky move as we had no idea whether they had reinforcements sneaking up on us. We played it safe though, no chance we would lose that many men in a single siege again. As we had lost a lot of men by this point, we slowly made our way back where two of our armies had to fight against over 12,000 men. Basically we used our cavalry to encourage the enemies into attacking our center where we had actual pikemen. So this overall meant we eventually trapped all their forces in a box. But the thing is, everywhere else where we didn't have any pikes, our men were overrun. It was a valiant defeat, but so be it. Losing men weren't really that big of an issue for us anymore. Bactria had become a well-oiled war machine, especially after I decided to construct a new master field in Marakandra, which is all the way back home. Basically for the rest of the war, this single general was tasked to raise pikemen from Bukhara and bring them to the front line. At the same time, we used the city that started this war, Araya, to muster yet another army with even more impressive cavalry. Now this is where things get a bit weird. Apparently due to our expedition deep into the Atropat and Handland earlier, they had recalled all their armies to solve that issue. This basically allowed Satrakata, which is one of the nations we liberated, to expand. Eager to seize the moment, we marched out overwhelming an entire Persian army and continued to free the land from Atropat Khan influence. These attacks took a heavy toll on our manpower, so basically we had to split up our forces with most of our generals returning home to replenish. 
while the third army attempted to get back into the heartland of the Persian kingdom once again. On that travels we met what probably can be considered the worst general in the world. Basically our army hid in a forest just slightly north of the Persians. So as the Persian general thought we had retreated, they chose to pursue us, not knowing they were in reality chasing nothing. Ha! It is time to raise the lands. Wait, is that Mastodon? So, Mastodon, they're here in Armenia. How did this happen? I'm so confused. Apparently they control a shit ton of land, just like the Seleucids who actually have defeated the Ptolemaic dynasty. Luckily for us, the Macedonians seem to be on our side. The fact that they joined the war against Atropat Khan meant every battle we fought, like this one you can see here, improved our relations with them. So the Northwest is basically secured. Unless they attack the newly liberated settlement whom we are obligated to defend of course. But the AI would never do such a thing, right? Especially not after we did something so generous as join their war against the RDI. Well, officially. You won't see any Bactrian armies in Thrace just yet. Instead, we made plans to finish off our main threat from the campaign so far. We sent more armies towards the Sacros Mountains. But the Morians were on a counter-offensive, so we had to deal with them too. Despite their superior numbers, I was confident our high-tier army could outperform them. However, I must have forgotten I was playing this specific campaign, where everything just has to be an issue. Despite our best efforts to outsmart the Morians, their numbers simply were too much for us. Oh well, that is another army gone. But you know what, I'm actually getting used to that feeling. Is that a problem? Although we are struggling against the Morians, we were able to strike hard at the Persians, taking their capital for our own. Besides, I expected this walled settlement protected by the Cypress Mountains would be crucial for the future, as it was located right in between the Seleucid and Macedonian lands. Oh, don't you worry about me speaking of the Macedonians as if they are at war with us, or have attacked our ally or something. Nope. It definitely won't happen. Our core provinces worked on full capacity at mustering new units for our war effort. Basically, it worked like a war machine, just marching through each region, growing in size. The only thing is, they can't really leave the north as this happened. We'll cover that in a bit, as we have more urgent matters to attend to. The Persians have launched a massive invasion towards Epiphania. So we distracted them with the only trick I actually knew, by attacking them elsewhere. We used this anti-Anakin Skywalker location to smash their retinues. Our pikemen held the high ground while our Sokian units outflanked the hoplites. Taking Persepolis turned out to be a massive boon for us. Not only did our economy explode, but we also acquired a new wonder of the world. Furthermore, the neighboring regions appeared particularly weak at this very moment. We just need to replenish our army so we can march out again. This attack diverted the attention of the Persians, making them split up their power. This led to us being forced into making a heroic defense of the city we just captured, unlike in the Bactrian battle, where we were severely outmatched. We actually had a decent chance of survival here. As the city consisted of multiple layers, we chose to abandon the outer walls. As it turns out, this was a slight mistake as this led to way more casualties on our side as we had nothing to protect us from their range units. But we prevailed nonetheless. We had to stop our advance for a bit, but we prevailed. We did take out the last Atropatkan armies in the east, meaning their last stronghold was in Seleucia. But somehow they still managed to cause trouble. Ragai fell for a moment until our own troops could get the town back in line. After that defeat, the Ilimari surrendered, easing the pressure on our lands even further. Now all we have to deal with is basically the Morians in the south and the nomads to the north. So far they haven't done anything, just standing there, raiding the countryside. This city literally felt like Hadrian's Wall or something similar, a bastion defending our entire kingdom. Their hordes were a terrifying sight, but as long as they stay there, they won't be an issue. However, as you might have guessed already, this stance is only temporary. Until then, let's focus on the south. Basically, I had cooked up quite an ambitious plan to deal with the Seleucids. Something I have always wondered whether it was possible or not. 
This was the perfect campaign to try it in. You'll see what I'm talking about soon enough. But for it to work, we need the Morian lands. I had already sent down reinforcements to that war effort, but they were cut off by hostile armies. This was quite an issue as this extended our time in the scorching desert as well as delaying our return to the northern border. I can't state enough how tense it was at this moment. The fear alone of the nomads unopposed plowing through our lands like until the hunt scared me to the core. I mean, we had two entire armies defending the border, but like, in reality we are talking a horse archers against peasants. Not the best of odds. Appear strong where you are weak, I guess. Inevitably we made progress taking a bit more land and also broke through the patrols to reach Persepolis without reinforcements. Fuck yeah! Just for your interest, the Western Front wasn't exactly quiet while all this was taking place. We had left our most experienced commander at Epiphania. Here he constantly had to fend off Atropatkan incursions. After some time of just replenishing our battle at forces, we finally had the strength to march out again. This time it was for the all-important port of Homosea. Last time we had ambitions of taking the city, we didn't even make it to the walls. This time they won't be able to stop us. Our artillery demolished their outer walls allowing our men to flood the streets. It was clear to see we had a technological advantage in terms of our equipment as they were basically fighting with farming tools here. Nevertheless, their outrageous attacks from back when we were at our lowest so long ago justified our attacks. The majority of the fight took place in the south, so as our breaches elsewhere were resolved, they rushed down there to secure the city. This decisive strike basically turned out to be the end of the Morians. The faction we liberated in their land so long ago were marching for Pora allowing us to march back north again, and while at it retake Kamana. We did have to fight a few of their remaining armies, but they were no match for us anymore. This couldn't have been timed more perfectly, as at the exact next turn the Great Bastion of Karth, held by our allies, fell to the Nomad Horde. This was bad, really bad. We had to act, but how? Our armies and tactics aren't actually made for fighting Nomads. But without Karth on our side, the entire realm is at risk. Hence we had no other choice but to march out. At first all we found was a single army garrisoning the city. Sounds easy enough, except it wasn't. Not only was there another army just to the north, but also after breaking our siege of Karth, the Roxolani revealed a third army behind our lines. Knowing we were outmatched in every way possible, we chose to keep a tight formation. This way we denied their horse archers any easy targets. If they want to take us down, they'll have to deal with our skirmishers firing back. But it didn't stop them from charging straight into our formation. Despite our best efforts, their endless hail of arrows and countless charges simply overwhelmed our tired forces. This basically felt like Crassus fighting the Parthians. The result was clear to everyone even before the battle had begun. You can probably imagine how panicked I was after that disaster. With one army wiped out and another extremely out of position, we were fucked. All our other armies were in the south, so it would take a while for them to get up here. So we made the only move we could, mustering a new army. While the north regroups, let us look at the south. In order to fully occupy the Sakuras Mountains, we needed to take Yolao. So we sent whatever forces we still had available to deal with the Persians living there. These were the people we actually made peace with earlier, so we actually caught them off guard. Finally, something easy without risk. Almost. The Seleucids had a massive fleet sailing around in the Persian Gulf. It posed a major threat to our newly acquired port. And as we hadn't really had the need to research anything related to naval warfare, we were severely outgunned on that sphere. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that from now on, at least for the foreseeable future, we will focus on naval technology and wharfs. It will take a while for it to be ready. But I promise you, it is worth more than just defending a random port in the south. There's a meaning to all of this. Back north, we were on the offense again. This time with three armies. However, on this occasion, we were lucky enough to discover a hidden and more importantly isolated Roxolani army. So of course we engaged. 
So in an effort to diminish the effectiveness of their arrows, we tried to form up in this nearby forest. However, this was an extremely slow affair, meaning the nomads had plenty of time to harass and harm our troops. Furthermore, a small of our men were on foot, it meant we couldn't counter charge. The ones were tempted to do it anyway, but crushed from multiple directions. This attack was practically a mess. It is no wonder that we lost half our army during this engagement. But now there should be a kinda clear passage to come, I hope. Once we had regrouped all our armies outside the city, we attacked. Our siege artillery broke multiple parts of their walls. However, this only unleashed the nomads into the open field. Our own cavalry blocked the Roxolani from outflanking us from the west while a smaller contingent attempted to get into the city from the south. Basically, the plan was to use these cavalry units to divert some of the defenders away from the frontal assault, making it easier for us to break through. However, forgetting how stupid the AI was, we captured the town square and eventually winning the battle through that without having to deal with all of their units. With the northern bastion in our control again, the realm just felt that tiny bit safer. The city will inevitably be made into a fortress or something like that, without the need of any army to defend it, yet still have one to be extra safe. And with that, this relentless conflict finally saw a break in action. A much needed break. Our tireless diplomats began integrating allied territory into our influence. This is not something I'll talk too much about in the future, but basically we ended up getting control over the entire east. Such a cool feature. It was also at this time we decided to improve our military. Instead of these ragtag bands of levies and mediocre units, we deserved a professional army. Thanks to Avreya, the city we fought so hard for, this was now possible. Honestly, it was quite impressive to see the advancements we made during this time. We improved our economy, developed our technology, dealt with anything politics related with many prominent characters rising to power. And while doing all of this, still managed to construct a fine ass fleet. Well, as our influence at sea grew, so did the tension with the Arabian states contesting the same waters. We did eventually end up in a feud with Muscat to the southwest, which led to a major clash at the Persian Gulf. But as our ships were larger and superior to theirs in every way, we easily crushed their provocative personality. The casualties we suffered from this meant we didn't enforce a claim on their ports. We still have much to learn before we can dominate the seas. This time of peace and prosperity lasted almost three years. Unreal. Well, until this happened. The Macedonians have chosen a side. If they want to fight on the same side as the Seleucids, it is their own fault. Well, the Morian lands are ours. So let's begin the most high risk and dangerous plan I have ever performed in total war. We have all heard of the great Hannibal Barker and his impressive crossing of the Alps. What made it so unique was the fact that no one thought it was possible. The insane plan caught the romance completely off guard. And I want to be able to do the same. Perform a maneuver no one ever saw coming. Something so insane not even you guys would be able to think of it. So, in order for me to test this insanity of mine, I ask you guys what would be our equivalent of crossing the Alps. Despite your many guesses, none of you actually matched my plan. Don't get me wrong, your ideas weren't stupid by any imagination. Going through Armenia or the steppes or sailing through the Black Sea are all viable options. But the thing is, these ideas are all technically possible in Rome too, without too many issues. Sure, it would take a wild march all the way through the steppes, but that's about it. No, my plan technically shouldn't be possible in the game. I want to transport a fully formed army all the way from Moria around Arabia, past the Seleucid fleets, and land in Upper Egypt behind the Seleucid lines. Okay, hear me out here for a second, okay? 
Yes, you're right, we will only have supplies to settle half that distance, and the rest will be attrition mania. But this is where I might have found a mad solution. As soon as our transport is about to run out of supplies, we will have a second fleet take over, escorting them for a bit while the previous fleet sells back to restock their provisions. We will then repeat this maneuver until we reach Ethiopia or something. This is supposed to happen while we have to avoid engaging this elusive fleet that we know is patrolling these waters. If it takes out any of our supply ships or the transports for that matter, the plan will be ruined. So many things can go wrong here, but surely you must give me this one. This plan, if executed successfully, will probably be the most legendary military feat in Divided Empire history. So let's begin. First, we needed to deal with this issue. Somehow a masked army slipped through our naval blockade of their lands and was marching for Ashvakas, our Mauryan usurper allies. I suspect they were doing this while we were bullied by the Seleucid navy forcing us into the high seas. Luckily for us though, the army I had planned to lead the invasion of Egypt was already in the south, meaning we now had a chance to test this new tactical setup of ours. And there was certainly room for improvements. Apparently these scorpions were locked to the ground giving them a limited use during an assault such as this one. But that is why we have elite hoplites and mighty elephants. This minor Arabian nuisance was squashed in a heartbeat. This also granted our fleet some much needed refuge from the Seleucids. Did you expect the loss of an ally would turn out to be in our favor? I certainly didn't. While we prepared the ships at Hamosea, my eyes stayed on our other front lines. Occasionally, the Roxolani sent down raiding parties, but our new and enhanced defenses kept the border safe. The Cypress Mountains, on the other hand, looked more vulnerable than ever. Although two completely reformed armies were on their way to reinforce this frontier, the third and least equipped army was under constant threat of an attack by the Meshen and Atropatkan legions that are growing in size. And don't forget the Macedonians who could appear at any moment. With that said, it was actually our age-old blood feud enemy that seemed to be the most aggressive. We tried to force an engagement and inevitably we did smash their vanguard army. But this offensive decision left our alliance overextended and vulnerable. Something the Persians desperately tried to exploit. We had to leave our baggage train behind to escape their wrath. Our seasoned commanders came up with a cunning idea to set up ambushes hoping to divide and defeat the Atropat Khan once and for all. Gladly before the Seleucid army gets too far into the mountains. At this time I also sent out diplomats to the Medewi in order to eventually secure military access and safe passage through the land. Also my personal immersion probably took a step too far as I accidentally assassinated my own faction leader, making Demetrius the first new ruler of Bactria. The reason I'm calling this going a step too far is because this dead ruler of ours was a highly experienced commander participating in our ambush plans. So as the Atropatkan leadership realized this change, they sent forth a smaller vanguard to trigger our ambush to then strike with their entire army. We tried to flee back into the range of Epiphania, but this only left our armies divided. So now we found ourselves with a battle where we were outmanned 3 to 1. We only had two things going for us, these highly equipped warriors that we spent the previous period of peace to muster, and the most experienced commander in all of Bactria spearheading the defense. Our Mauryan archers dominated the ranged engagement, forcing the Persians to charge into melee. Straight into our pikemen! Our cavalry maneuvering was especially notable in this battle as we performed countless hidden run attacks inspired by the nomads. Combine this with our elephants and you have a boss of death. Eventually, our mounted units cleared out the flanks allowing us to perform countless rear charges. This led to a breakthrough on the right making it possible to envelop their entire army. The fact that we won this day was a pure miracle. It saved our entire campaign from disaster yet again. This victory shifted the balance of power to our side, big time. 
We immediately rushed their retreating forces, hoping to end their existence once and for all. This was such an opportune moment. I even chose to delay our insane expedition. Besides, the second fleet wasn't ready and the Meishen were threatening our border. To our luck, one of their armies marched north to defend Seleucia, leaving their own port settlement ripe for the taking. As they saw our approach, their cowardly commander fled towards the west, meaning we easily cruised into the town. With one foot in Mesopotamia, it was only fitting for us to occupy the province capital. We made our way forward towards the last Persian stronghold. This effort of ours in the west probably meant the army I initially intended to go on the expedition might be a bit too busy in this western war effort. Hence, I decided to muster an entirely new army in Pora. They also had to deal with this random ass slave revolt, so it was fitting enough. And nothing ever came of that revolt by the way. Here's another moment of my immersion going a bit too far, as Demetrius I marched north to assist against Atropat Khan, almost seasoned and battle scarred commander of ours, wanted the glory of conquest all for himself, so he struck without all the Bactrian armies in position. The thought of him being the one to liberate the famous city of Babylon was too great of a reward for him I suppose. We attempted to make several breaches on both sides of the Tigris river that was flowing through the city. Heck, we even had a group of cavalry led by the great commander himself attempt to flank around and hit them from behind like we did against the Roxolani back in the day. This was a highly coordinated attack with multiple units involved. Our elephants were used to try and break through the chokes but it wasn't successful at all. Our units didn't gain an inch assaulting the breaches we created. The only chance of victory was from the cavalry in the opposite end of the city. However, this was something the Persians had prepared for. Suddenly, spearmen appeared on the bridges towards the town center, and multiple cavalry units honed in on our position. We had to leave one cavalry unit behind to hold this small wooden bridge that led straight to the breaches. The thing is, once we reached the actual engagement, most of our soldiers had lost faith in our attack and began retreating. We only got to charge them once before the cavalry and the best commander Bactria ever had got overwhelmed. And with that, we withdrew from Seleucia. This was a massive loss that led to the end of an entire generation apart from a single underdeveloped lineage. Not long after, the Persians went on the offensive again, trying to finish what they started. Once more we lost an army, but don't forget how heroic they fought against incredible odds on so many occasions. The next turn our faction leader made it to the city. This time around, it wasn't much of a fight as the other armies had dealt with most of the defenders. It took three completely reformed and elite Bactrian armies to deal the final blow to Atropat Khan, but Seleucia was ours at last. However, now we are directly bordering the Seleucids and soon to do the same with the Macedonians who are closing in, in the north. So I'm not sure if this is a good thing. In the south, the Mersheans, despite their heavy losses from attrition, wanted to make one final effort to retake their home we stole from them. The army we had garrisoned to defend this port was the only army on our front lines that hadn't been reformed yet. So the fact that two armies came to attack them was a huge threat. It was only thanks to our swift cavalry, which fought bravely to delay the second army allowing our units inside the city to deal with one army at a time that made sure we survived here. It was a close call with the general getting close to meet fate on multiple occasions. But despite our many casualties, it turned out as a victory for us. As we needed to replenish our army somehow, and didn't have time to return all the way back home to our core provinces, we turned to these Babylonian heavy spearmen. These units good enough to defend the south, but no way they can assault the Seleucid settlement. Luckily, this army isn't in any immediate danger. No, that was more for the armies in the north. Not only do we have a Seleucid and Macedonian army at our border, but also the Roxolani have turned their heads towards ships and using them as a way to slip past our defenses. The only thing we actually could deal with was the Seleucids. The city of Seleucia really needed reinforcements, and as I doubt the Macedonians will attack us straight away, we sent our second army down there to help. A good idea, as they besieged the city with two more armies approaching from the deep desert. 
It was a miracle we defeated their first army, which had the consequence of the Seleucid delaying their offensive for a bit. But at least we know the armies are on the front lines, meaning our expedition, if it is able to land in Upper Egypt, will steam through their lands unopposed. The army was just about to be ready as well. Let's take a closer look at it, shall we? The main core of the army was composed of five phalanx infantry units. They were chosen for the expedition as they were excellent for holding certain positions such as a center on a battlefield or crucial street in a town. However, they aren't all that great for scaling walls, hence we also brought four sets of greco bactrian assault infantry. Besides, they can act as both fast flanking units or flexible reserve units during a field battle. For dealing with cavalry and overall holding our flanks, we have brought just two units of Thurio spears. They have proven to be useful in the past, so they were a safe choice. In terms of the range department, we had no more than two units of Bactrian slingers and a squad of ballistae. Not much, but that is because I doubt we will need much more than that. The Ballistae is obviously for dealing with world settlements such as Alexandria or Jehuda. Besides, if it comes to a skirmish fight, we have four units of cavalry to hunt them down. Okay, they weren't really trained for such a task, they were more of a shock cavalry type, with two of their units even being equipped with heavy armor from Persia. Last but certainly not least, the prize of them all. Or Indian elephants. If it comes down to a scrappy fight between pikemen, we can deploy these lads behind the enemy lines to crush their formation and fighting spirit. The commander of the army was the leader of the Macedonian nobility. Yeah, that's about it. No notable feats or anything. Just a high status which qualified him for the task. Okay, back to the actual action. Remember how I briefly mentioned the Voxolani taking to the seas? Yeah, they just liberated Nysaea which is a settlement in the middle of our unprotected kingdom. I just took some time sending an army to that region that wasn't the northern defenders, but they quickly found themselves greatly outnumbered. This time we had mother nature as our defenses, with the trees shielding us from the nomadic arrows. Our main line still strong with our reserves being deployed on our flanks. The cavalry charged ahead even winning many of their engagements. However, it was at the decisive strike at our inexperienced commander that resulted in the fall of another Bactrian army. And can you believe the Macedonians were right on the doorstep too? They had to be stopped. At least this was a heroic victory. Inevitably our haggard defenders of the north dealt with the invading nomads. But another army was already on its way towards us. Honestly, it looked worse than it actually was. But do you want to see something beautiful? After defeating a second Macedonian army in a meaningless battle, Demetrius I, our faction leader, went on a tremendous campaign marching up through Mesopotamia. This surely caught both the eye and wrath of the Seleucids. The perfect distraction for our incredible plan. You see, while most of the latter events here took place, we had set sail from Amosea. The voyage was dangerous and scary with its elusive fleet patrolling our only route without entering deeper waters. A recipe for disaster. Yet they never attacked. The journey was long and slow. As expected not even halfway past Arabia did our first set of supplies run out. But as planned we swapped fleets with the replaced one barely being able to make it back home. The predictions for our new supplies was that it wouldn't even last the rest of the journey. Another drop had to be made if we wanted to avoid attrition. But we didn't have time for it. Neither will the new supplies be able to make it here in time, nor did we have a more opportune moment to strike than this. Two massive Seleucid armies march for Seleucia. Down the fleet. Who cares if they take a bit of attrition? The army was all that mattered. And so it was. We had spent almost 20 turns conquering and pacifying the south, 10 more to muster a sizable fleet, an additional 10 turns dealing with the Arabian intervention, followed by another 5 turns of recovery, 
All of this led to almost 14 turns at sea, avoiding the Seleucid fleets. But now, 59 turns later, we had at last done what until now was thought to be impossible. We had arrived behind the Seleucid lines. Now Egypt was at our mercy. The invasion began with probably the most important assault of them all. If we failed to occupy Ptolemaeus Theron, our fleet would have nowhere to resupply. Fortunately, due to us having secured an alliance with the Medewi before we even set sail, their armies were already in position to coordinate the strike. Our combined forces flooded the streets, with Dinomenes scoring his first victory. With the foothold established, our next target was Alexandria, and after that Antioch of course, along with the possibility of taking back the seat of our ancestors. As a parting gift before we advanced into Egypt, the Medewi granted us command of some of their finest warriors. Furthermore, we ordered 600 of our assault infantry to stay behind to train additional Ethiopians to later be used as supporting units during our invasion. The Seleucids were quick to react, with them trying to perform a naval invasion from their holdings in Arabia. But that is exactly what we had our fleet to defend against, and also another reason why Ptolemaeus Theron was such an important town. Our strike was swift and effective. Our many turns researching naval battle tactics in the past was really paying off now. It did so once again as we slapped their entire naval presence in the Red Sea, meaning the Seleucids had no way to backdoor our plans. We marched straight into Egypt, however unexpectedly a Seleucid ally showed up to defend their lands. It gave us a bit of trouble with them forcing us to reposition our units, however their defenses were no match to our combined Bactrian and Ethiopian alliance. This did mean we took higher casualties earlier in our mission here than we actually expected, but no chance it would slow us down while we had the edge. Mere Zwormus fell soon after. Another attempt to what I only can call a response to our surprise invasion was the Thorax reform. That supposedly revolutionized the Seleucid army, but I doubt they can afford it if we are to conquer Alexandria itself. The city was heavily fortified, with an additional navy garrisoning the famed city. But after a while of preparing siege equipment, the battle was on. And we used quite a cunning tactic to get us ahead here. While the vast majority of our armies had their assault from this direction here, a small contingent of Ethiopian archers had used the cover of darkness to get in behind the Seleucid defenses. This meant that once the assault began, they would unopposed scale the walls. Our main army was basically a massive distraction, so we could open one of the gates for our cavalry to flood the streets. Despite the extreme casualties it took to secure Alexandria, it was more than worth it. Apart from being able to muster these Thorax units that originally were intended to be used by the Seleucid armies, this also gave us straight access to the Mediterranean itself. This was a completely new warfront, meaning establishing a presence was a must. However, this was something the Seleucid realized too, so they immediately foiled our plans to then launch another major invasion from Arabia. Sadly, this was the start of a long line of battles I didn't get to record, the replays off before the last room 2 update. Meaning, for quite a bit of time now, you won't see any battles. Nevertheless, our fleet caught them at the coast, making sure nothing came of this attack. And may I just say, thank Poseidon for those Ballista ships. They were bloody crucial here, but I actually made an honest mistake here in occupying the port settlement nearby, meaning the Seleucids got the chance to smash our fleet to bits. This was then followed up by this incredible defense of the Nile, where the Kyrenians used the low flowing parts of the river to slam into our lines. This was a battle map I had never seen before while playing a campaign, so it was honestly a surprise we scored a heroic victory here. After that battle and as the Medea we had occupied Memphis, we marched towards the west to secure a second port, so we could build up a new fleet. 
this frontier would inevitably be conquered and held by a new mercenary army. But instead of this side quest, I'll rather talk about Armenia. You see, as we basically had the Seleucids on the ropes and only the Macedonians threatening us from the north, I sent up two entire legions expecting Mesopotamia to be in safe hands. And sure enough, we captured not just one or two settlements, but three. Okay, Asa Masata was basically abandoned right away, as the Macedonian armies approached and myself believing Thospia would be easier to defend. And for quite a while after this specific event here, we didn't feel the presence of the Macedonians till it was too late. In the meantime though, we advanced on the nomads hoping to seize the Caucasus mountains, and use them as a natural shield against the horse lords. We did also contemplate a proper mission into the steppes, but got cold feet after seeing a horde nearby. Furthermore, we ended up making contact with Rome around this time. As I was already locked in a war on basically three fronts, I didn't want to open up a fourth one. So we ended up making friendly relations with the Romans by joining some of their many wars. By this point we had two fully formed fleets in the Mediterranean. Until we made a foolish attempt to attack Anatolia from the sea as well, which we got soundly defeated doing. And also as we were trying to flee, the Seleucid navy stopped by to get absolutely crushed, fuck the Seleucids man. We then returned to Alexandria, where we then had our fleet replenished. The Seleucids were basically a wet noodle compared to the Atropat Khan that we defeated so long ago. They had nothing. The only one who actually was able to resist us was the Macedonians. And after going back on the offensive again because we thought Asamosata was an easy target, two Macedonian armies assaulted the city. And although we took down basically half of their entire fighting force, we lost the battle, and with it Demetrius I, our faction leader. Not only that, but the UD besieged our fortress in the Caucasus, right after we took control of it. This invasion of Armenia and beyond was an obvious mistake by this point. The only set of reinforcements I could afford to invest into this conflict was a single army from Mesopotamia leaving just one other army to defend the entire central part of our kingdom from the Seleucid noodles. They had to be finished off and fast, so we created a second legion made of mercenaries and levies to patrol the south, while Dinomenes and the Ethiopian Auxiliary Legion, which had mostly been replaced by Greeks from Alexandria, marched for the Levant accompanied by our two fleets sailing along the coast. The city defense against the Udi was almost equally as impressive a defense as when we stalled out the siege of our capital, meaning we defended our northern front. Right after our reinforcements all the way from Araya appeared with a completely modernized army from the Thorax reforms. These units ended up being exactly what we needed to conquer the rest of this mountain range. This entire front line was basically a stalemate after this which basically doesn't matter as we made plenty of progress in the Levant. First we crushed a Seleucid fleet and then quickly after that, three of their mightiest commanders in a decisive battle. From here on out it was smooth sailing. The Ethiopian auxiliaries annexed all of Nabatea and secured the roads through the desert to connect Egypt to the rest of our kingdom. Our fleets however experienced quite a bit of pressure. After slabbing one army trying to repel our blockade, a major Seleucid fleet showed up, causing us to withdraw. We tried to do the same with the second fleet too, but it ended up getting caught, leading to one of my most spectacular naval victories ever. There was also this stupid interaction where the Seleucid forces straight up just passed our outpost to take out both our fleets and the port itself. Of course we recaptured the town, but it was a massive break in our momentum. The walled city of Demetrius fell to a combined attack from both the east and southwest, officially cutting the Seleucid landmass in half. Apparently the desert regions were harder to occupy than expected, as our Mauryan legions got cut down. But in time it would fall to our might. Our navy did manage to both capture Salamis and even more impressively defend it against the Macedonian fleet. At the cost of basically every ship, it was quite a mess though, so forget about that. Antioch was secured by having the Seleucid sally out, and then basically marching into the Seleucid capital without issues. Our surprise invasion into Egypt had clearly paid off. 
with us soon beginning our invasion of Anatolia. Or that would have been the case if not for the fact that this extensive operation had left our armies fatigued. Exactly what the Macedonians must have waited for. Immediately after, a siege of Antioch was established with additional armies on their way to reinforce. Not wanting to risk another experienced army being destroyed, we made a rushed evacuation sailing straight for Salamis. And as our fleet was doing this, the Macedonians ordered a strike at the shores of Egypt, not to mention the fact that the Nasamones rose up against our so-called tyrannic rule and straight up slaughtered two of our legions before laying siege to Kairi. Not to forget the nomads who still occasionally wandered down into our land to either raid, sack or kill our villages and citizens. We might be the largest kingdom in the world, but without any armies to defend it, we might as well be called the most vulnerable kingdom ever. Basically our situation can be described like this. With one army recovering at Salamis, two armies defending the Caucasus and are badly wounded while doing it, one army defending Thospia and the entirety of Mesopotamia which clearly was a lost cause as Seleucids just kept flooding through their lines there, and just one minor army of levies in Egypt, our realm was drastically outnumbered here, again. Reinforcements were on the way from Araya, but they are almost 8 turns away. We might actually have to use Scorched Earth tactics to survive this. With the fall of Antioch and as we had all these other major threats around the kingdom, something had to be done, and fast. Dinomenes was worth nothing hiding at sea and couldn't return to the conflict before replenishing his army for a bit. All the way up in Armenia, we were working on forming a new army to help withstand the Macedonian offensive in Mesopotamia. But our armies were too scattered to make any progress. So we turned to diplomacy, which I have both tried and failed doing in every war I have ever been in throughout this campaign. And surprisingly actually, this time, we actually were successful. The Nasamnes agreed to stand down. Thank Athena for letting them see reason. The same was actually also done with the nomads, although it only lasted like a turn or two. But this short time of peace convinced me to redeploy our North Point army, which had basically become our equivalent to the Night's Watch or something. As this army was so used to traversing the massive steps, their movement range had become so insane they could travel from one side of our kingdom to the other in just four turns, leaving the other reinforcements from Area in the dirt. Utter insanity that is. Furthermore, with this newfound peace, we established a new fleet in Kyrene to help contest the shores. And also, while well, now that we are talking about the sea, we also transported our major army back from Salamis over to the mainland where they were supposed to fortify Demetrius, the next bastion in the Macedonian warpath. This led to me making a third or possibly even fourth attempt, depending on how you see it, at raiding Amosata. But like every other time I had tried this, the Macedonians were in position to absolutely slaughter our army. Europus and also Sukma fell soon after that. But even though the Macedonians were on the offensive, it was around this time the balance shifted. The Macedonian outpost they created in Egypt fell to a rebellion leading to their navy sailing towards Kyrene. This basically meant our minor legion of levies hired a bunch of mercenaries to retake the port, securing the south again. Regarding Syria and Anatolia, I had honestly no clue on how to handle these overwhelming armies. Like look at this. I only had one plan-ish, which was to blockade Antioch and hope they would make a foolish move to break past our fleets or something. Basically we had to take whatever opportunity we could. It's just this minor one at Europus. But believe it or not, the real breakthrough was actually at Amusata, the city where we've lost so many armies. After our scout uncovered that just a single Macedonian army defended the town, and as we had two fully formed armies in position to strike, we risked basically all our defending armies in Armenia for this single offensive. And oh look at this, the battles are back. Quite fitting as this was the exact same maneuver the Macedonians used to take down our own faction leader, at this very same town actually. It's time for revenge. 
our ballistae hammered their contingents with giant rocks, while our newly acquired Cretan archers picked off any hostile cavalry getting a tiny bit too close to our formation. Their elite companion cavalry clearly outclassed our thorax units that we adopted from the Seleucids. However, they dominated any ground engagement they were in. It was pure pike on pike action with the Macedonians slowly outclassing us on that front. It would even have led to a defeat if not for the cataphract cavalry that made it in behind their lines to secure the battle. It was an absolutely decisive victory, with us getting a major breakthrough in the north and with the Macedonians being unable to respond. And also as North Point arrived, we began closing in from the south as well. Our newly established fleet from Karin, which had finally reached full strength, adopted this wedge formation to ram through the Macedonian fleet that harassed our southern shore. It was magnificent to watch. Up in Armenia, we continued our advance with us smashing another major Macedonian army without any additional hostile armies to save it. Divide and conquer, I say. Equally as important was the decision to pick when or where to fight. This specific battle here was declined, not wanting to be outnumbered, leaving Furuniki completely vulnerable. But this one further north was obligated as it was against over 10,000 Macedonians. Except it didn't quite feel like it, as we chose not to control the large armies in this specific battle here. A trick I learned from my good friend Samari. Furthermore, he also taught me this neat trick where you burn down one part of your fortification, encouraging your enemies to only attack from that direction. Quite clever actually, if not for the fact that this completely backfired on us. Not only did the Macedonians focus down our pikemen with their skirmishers, breaking the only reason this tactic was actually viable to us, but also as our own units routed, they constantly got replaced by inferior garrison units from the useless town rather than the actual army that also was in reinforcement range. Basically our entire front line broke without getting replaced, forcing us to retreat. We lost basically another army here, and I can only imagine that they didn't follow through with the attack to finish us off, as we actually ended up killing all their three commanders. Sometimes we just gotta be lucky I guess. After that, the Macedonians chose to somewhat divide their forces, allowing us to take down two more of their armies before falling back to replenish and recruit new units. Boenike was reinforced by our two fleets, and Sukma was recaptured as well. Amazing. Just like the fact that Mastodon occupied Salamis. It's okay though, we just had to blast our way through the Macedonian fortification, with the Agama pikemen getting absolutely crushed by our Christian archers. The game of Pikeman might be the best close combat unit in the entire game, but they ain't got nothing on our archers. A crushing victory. This was then followed up with the navy doing its thing and North Point smashing another army just to take control of Antioch afterwards. What seemed to have been an absolutely impossible task for a few turns ago had just completely dissolved by us taking risks, going for small opportunities and getting a bit lucky. Another hostile army was defeated outside the walls of Demetrius, which was a delight to our plans. Basically, this left just one enemy army within our own lands, which we both engaged and defeated at this amazing river crossing. Beautiful scenes indeed. After this, we took a few turns to lick our wounds and regroup before the final push. But before we continue with that, I would like to mention what I have neglected the most throughout this story here. Namely, the economic aspect and how we finance our armies. Basically, as a consequence of our constant state of warfare, we hadn't really been able to develop any proper economic provinces apart from Bactria or Sogdia which only helped for the size of our entire army that we had back then. But as we progressively gained control of Egypt, Mesopotamia and inevitably Syria, we began investing into exporting agricultural products such as grain and livestock from these specific provinces. And as we developed these provinces more and more, they eventually sustained the entire economy of everything in our kingdom. Quite impressive I must say. This was additionally followed up by the fact that every new level our different characters got, both commanders, governors and agents and all that, 
they would receive a skill that would help lower Empire maintenance. It got so out of hand that we eventually actually got Empire maintenance down to below 10%. Absolutely insanity. This was basically what funded all of our armies that were about to push into Anatolia. The first strike came here, where one of the Macedonian armies approached to the right of our formation. If only their royal Peltas could do anything against our bronze shield pikes though. It turned out to be quite a mess for battle, but so be it. Scrappy fights are part of warfare. The victorious armies marched deeper into Anatolia while the North Point Legion would clean up the coastline. This victory of ours seemed to have smashed some sense into the Macedonians. A bit too late in my opinion though. The next turn was quite eventful. First of all we took side, which was the last settlement loyal to the Seleucids, leaving just a few loyal ships to sail around the Mediterranean. Second, we declared war upon Karana, a Macedonian favoring state. If we left them while we pushed west, they'll just backstab us. No chance we'll let such a thing happen. Besides, they were pretty much a walkover just like the remaining Macedonian armies, meaning we could lay siege to Massacre. They inevitably chose to sally out, where our overwhelming numbers of phalanxes led to us just forming a straight line for the Cappadocians to run directly into, while our own cavalry and flanking infantry cleaned up the flanks and rear. After that kinda easy victory, we made contact with the Black Sea, and while doing so, eliminating yet another Macedonian ally. We also reached a new Imperium ranking by doing so, which basically only led to us establishing governors in our new agricultural provinces I mentioned earlier. It also led to us falling out with the Romans and them cancelling all our treaties. But no sign of aggression actually. Just like we wanted as we had plenty of that ourselves, charged at the Macedonians and their allies. At lightning speed we blitzed through their lands with our spies giving us intel to plan a siege of Ankara. However, after losing basically all of their armies in Armenia and the Levant, the Macedonians actually managed to scrap together one final army, with the hopes of potentially slowing down our offensive. Rain was pouring down with Zeus watching the final battle between the last two Diadoshi. Our slingers used their range to take down the Macedonian Javelin Cavalry, forcing this battle to become a contest between the Red Cape Agamer Pikemen and our Bronze Shield Pike. Out on the left, our Thorax units chased and inevitably caught the Phrygian units deployed out there. Our own Babylonian mercenaries used their larger shields to dodge the Macedonian pikes, getting close into striking distance. It was a pure bloodbath, with both sides losing dozens of brave warriors. But in the end, our cavalry came in clutch, deciding the outcome. The rest of Anatolia fell without much of a contest, meaning the Macedonians had lost everything east of the Aegean. Oh, I might actually have forgotten something. How annoying the nomads actually have been throughout this fucking conflict. I think it's only fitting we showed them how fun it is to be invaded. The only real resistance they showed was a minor navy assisted by the Macedonians. But as you might have guessed, we straight up outclassed them on that front. Our ships that were way smaller than the ones sailing around in the Mediterranean just pinned down the barbarians to then finish the battle that way. I would later find out our rather swift campaign into the steppes was because the nomads had most of their hordes in Dacia, where they made fat stacks pillaging the barbarian tribes living there. But before we actually knew better, the steps were secured, meaning all we had to do was retake our ancestral capital. A mission that began with the invasion of Athens, and then afterwards with our two finest legions marching through Thrace. It ended up being the invasion force that landed in Athens that received the honor of securing the birthplace of Alexander, and thus bringing an end to our constant struggle for survival.